Lux presents Hollywood. Lieber Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Starring Betty Davis, Ann Baxter, Reginald Gardner, and Gary Merrill in All About Eve. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. While I was directing plays on the New York stage, I had a first-hand opportunity to watch the frantic struggle of young actresses to attain stardom in the theater. But I'm happy to say that none of them used the tactics of the young woman in our play tonight, All About Eve. I first read of Eve's unorthodox behavior in a magazine story by Mary Orr entitled The Wisdom of Eve. And I was delighted to see 20th Century Fox turn it into the Academy Award-winning picture of 1950. A portion of this honor may be attributed to the unforgettable performances of Betty Davis, Ann Baxter, and Gary Merrill. We're very gratified to present them tonight in their original roles, starring with Reginald Gardner as the malicious critic. And I'm sure if we really knew all about Eve we discover Lux Flakes in her household. Lux Flakes are a must for all discriminating women who demand gentle, safer washing care. Now, All About Eve, starring Betty Davis as Margot, Ann Baxter as Eve, Reginald Gardner as Addison DeWitt, and Gary Merrill as Bill. To those of the New York theater, no other tribute, critical acclaim, or glorification can approach the heights of recognition represented in the Sarah Siddons Award for Distinguished Achievement. A moment ago, in the venerable hall of the Sarah Siddons Society, this most cherished honor came to a young actress named Eve Harrington. Among the many eminent personalities present is the noted critic Addison DeWitt. This is Eve's hour. Beautiful, radiant, poised, she's about to make her speech of acceptance. The hall rings with applause and bravos. Everyone is looking at Eve. All except Karen Richards. Karen's made a little pile of crumbs on the tablecloth. She's patting it with a spoon, staring at it absently. I wonder what Karen Richards is thinking about. Eve. Eve Harrington. It seems a lifetime ago that rainy night in October. I hurried down the alley to the stage door. But where was she? <laughs> Strange. I'd become so accustomed to seeing her here night after night, I found myself looking for a girl I'd never spoken to, wondering Mrs. where Mrs. Richards. She... Oh, there you are. Well, it seemed odd suddenly you're not being here. <laughs> after all, six nights a week for weeks, watching Margot Channing enter and leave a theater. I hope you don't mind my speaking to you. It took every bit of courage I could raise. To speak to a playwright's wife? <laughs> I'm the lowest form of celebrity. You're Margot Channing's best friend. You and your husband are always with her. Tell me, what do you do in between the time Margot goes in the theater and comes out? Just huddle and wait? Oh, no. I see the play. See the play? You mean you, you've seen every performance? Yes. Well, apart from everything else, don't you find it expensive? Standing room doesn't cost much. I manage. You're coming with me, young lady. I'm going to take you to Margot. Oh, no. Oh, yes, yeah, she's got to meet you. Oh, no, no, I'd be imposing on her. I'd be just another tongue-tied, gushing fan. There isn't another like you. There couldn't be. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Eve. Eve Harrington. Margot was in her dressing room. Lloyd, my husband, was with her, and, of course, Bertie, Margot's maid. Good morning, Karen. Margot's just been interviewed by a lady reporter from the South. And the minute it gets printed, they're going to fire on Gettysburg all over again. It was Fort Sumter they fired on. Bertie, where's my cold cream? Lloyd, honey, be a playwright with guts. Write me a play about a nice, normal woman who just shoots her husband. I find these wisecracks increasingly less funny, Margot. Aged in Wood happens to be a fine and distinguished play. That's my loyal little woman. Oh, relax, kid. It's just me and my big mouth. Well, it's, it's just that you get me so mad sometimes. Of all the women in the world with nothing to complain about... Ain't it the truth? Yes, it is. You're talented, famous, wealthy, people waiting around night after night just to see you, even in the rain. Autograph fiends, little beasts. They're your fans, your audience. They're nobody's audience. They never see a play or a movie, even. They're never indoors long enough. 
Well, there's one indoors right now. I brought her back to see you. You've what? She's just outside the door. Birdie. Yeah? The heave-ho. Now, you can't put her out, Margot. She worships you. You must have spotted her by now. She's always there. Oh, I know. The mousy one with the trench coat and the funny hat. Yes. Oh, how could I miss her every night, every matinee? Oh, come in, Eve. Margot, this is Eve Harrington. How do you do, my dear? Oh, brother. Hello, Miss Channing. My husband. Hello, Miss Harrington. How do you do, Mr. Richards? And this is my dear friend and companion, Miss Bertie Coonan. Oh, brother. Miss Coonan? Oh, brother, what? When she gets like this, all of a sudden, she's playing Hamlet's mother. Well, I'm sure you must have things to do in the bathroom, Bertie, dear. If I haven't, I'll find something until you get normal. Dear Bertie. I was just telling Margot and Lloyd how often you've seen the play. Yes, every performance. Well, then, am I safe in assuming that you like it? I'd like anything Miss Channing played in. Would you really? How sweet. I doubt very much that you'd like her in The Hairy Ape. Oh, please don't misunderstand me, Mr. Richards. I think that part of Miss Channing's greatness lies in her ability to pick the best plays. Your new plays for Miss Channing, isn't it? Well, how'd you hear about it? There was an item in Addison DeWitt's column. I like the title, Footsteps on the Ceiling. Oh. Well, let's get back to this one. Every performance, hmm? Why? Yes, there are other plays. Not with you in them. Not by Mr. Richards. But you must have friends, a home, family. No. Tell us about it, Eve. If I only knew how. Try. Well, it started with a play before this one. Remembrance? Did you see it here in New York? San Francisco. I went one night, the most important night of my life until now. I found myself going the next night, and the next, and the next. Then when the show went east, I went east. Eve... Why don't you start at the beginning? Oh, I couldn't possibly interest you. Oh, please. Well, I guess it started back home, Wisconsin, that is. There was just Mom and Dad and me. Farmers were poor in those days. So I quit school, became a secretary in a brewery. It wasn't much fun, but it helped at home. There was a little theater group there, like a drop of rain on the desert. That's where I met Eddie. We played Lillian three times. I was awful. Then the war came and we got married. Eddie was in the Air Force. They sent him to the South Pacific. You were with the OWI, weren't you, Mr. Richards? And how did you know that? I looked you up in Who's Who. Then came a letter from Eddie. He had a leave coming up. And I went to San Francisco to meet him. <coughs> Eddie wasn't there. They forwarded the telegram, the one from Washington, to say that Eddie wasn't coming at all, that Eddie was dead. I decided to stay in San Francisco... I found a job, and his insurance helped. And there were theaters in San Francisco. And then one night, Margot Channing came to play in Remembrance. And, well, here I am. What a story. Everything but the bloodhound snapping at her rear end. <laughs> Birdie, there are some human experiences that do not take place in a vaudeville house, and that even an ex-fifth-rate vaudevillian should understand and respect. I want to apologize for Birdie. Sorry, it's just my way of talking. Well, you didn't hurt my feelings, Miss Coonan. <clears throat> Call me Bertie. Oh, hi, you, Mr. Sampson. Hi, Bertie. For your information, Margot, my plane takes off in 47 minutes. And how do I find you? Not ready yet and looking like a junkyard. Thank you so much. Does my career mean nothing to you? Have you no human consideration? You show me a human and I might have. Oh, Bill. The Bill. airlines have clocks even if you haven't. I start shooting a week from Monday. Bill. I'm a junkyard. Bill, this is Eve Harrington. Hi. My wonderful junkyard. The mystery and dreams you find in a junkyard. Heaven help me, I love a psychotic. Oh, hello. What's your name? Eve. Eve Harrington. You've already met. Hmm? Where? Oh, Eve, you're not going. I think I'd better. It's been... I can hardly find the words to say how it's been. Thank you. No, no, don't go. Well, the four of you must have so much to say to each other with Mr. Sampson leaving. No, no, stick around. Tell you what, we'll put Stanislavski on his plane, you and I, and then go somewhere and talk. Well, if I'm not in the way... I'll shower and dress. I won't be a minute. Oh, Lloyd, we've got to go. Yeah. Uh, good luck, genius. Geniuses don't need luck. I do. No, we're not worried about you. Good night, Eve. I hope to see you again soon. I'll be at the old stand tomorrow matinee. This time, as a friend. I'll never forget this night as long as I live, Mrs. Richards. And I'll never forget you for making it possible. I can't remember why Lloyd and I had to leave, but I do remember that as we left, Eve started talking to Bill.
So you're going to Hollywood, Mr. Sampson? Just for one picture. Why? I just wondered. You just wondered what? Why you'd want to go out there. I mean, well, when a man's the best and most successful young director in the theater... The theater. What book of rules says the theater exists only in New York? Listen, Junior, and learn. Yes? You want to know, want to know what the theater is? The flea circus. Also opera, rodeos, carnivals, ballets, Indian tribal dances, punch and Judy, a one-man band. Wherever there's magic and make-believe in an audience, there's theater. From Donald Duck to Eleanor Adouzer, all theater. You don't have to understand them all. You don't like them all. Why should you? The theater's for everybody, you included, but not exclusively. So don't approve or disapprove. It may not be your theater, but it's theater for somebody somewhere. I just asked a simple question. And I shot my mouth off. <laughs> Nothing personal, Junior. Margot, I'm leaving here in exactly three seconds. So am I, if I can find my coat. It's right where you left it. Oh. Any messages for Tyrone Power, Bertie? Just give him my phone number. Kill the people, Mr. Sampson. Thanks, Bertie. You got the key, Bertie? I ain't forgot it yet. I'll see you at home in an hour. Eve, where are you going, dear? You don't really want me tagging along. Oh, now, don't be silly. This way. It's quicker if we cut across the stage. <laughs> Where is she, Bill? What happened to Eve? Oh, she's at the desk picking up my tickets. She said we had so little time together that she... She's quite a girl, Bill. I'd forgotten they grew that way anymore. Now, that lack of pretense, that sort of strange directness and understanding. Isn't it silly? Suddenly I've developed a big protective feeling toward her. A lamb loose in our big stone jungle. Bill, take care of yourself out there. I understand they have the Indians pretty well in hand. Don't get stuck on some glamour, puss. I'll try. You're not such a bargain, you know. You're a setup for some gorgeous, wide-eyed young babe. How childish are you going to get before you stop it? I don't want to be childish. I'd settle for just a few years. And cut that out right now. Am I going to lose you, Bill? Am I? As of this moment, you're six years old. Everything's ready, Mr. Sampson. Huh? Oh, oh, thanks, Eve. Your, your tickets, they'd like you to get right on the plane. Well, you've been very helpful. Good luck. Goodbye, Mr. Sampson. Knit me a muffler, Margot. Kiss me goodbye, Bill. Call me when you get in. On the hour. Hey, Junior, keep your eye on her. She's a loose lamb in a jungle. That same night, we went for Eve's things, her few pitiful possessions, and she moved into the little guest room. The next few weeks were out of a fairy tale. I was Cinderella in the last act. Eve became my sister, lawyer, mother, friend, psychiatrist, and cop. Her quiet efficiency, her constant anticipation of my wishes drove Bertie crazy, and I loved it. Yes, the honeymoon was on. Early one morning, the telephone awakened me. I was half groggy with sleep, and the operator made no sense at all. We are ready with your call to Beverly Hills, California. Wh where? What call? We are ready with the call you placed for 12 midnight California time to Mr. William Sampson in Beverly Hills. Go ahead, please. Margot, what a wonderful surprise. What a thoughtful, ever-loving thing to do. Bill, have I gone crazy, Bill? You're my girl, aren't you? That I am. Then you're crazy. Oh. When are you coming back? In a week. Well, I'm waiting. When are you going to say it? Oh, now, Bill, you know how much I do, but over a phone. Now, really, that's kid stuff. Kid stuff or not, it doesn't happen every day, and if you won't say it, then you can sing it. Sing it? Sure, like the Western Union boys used to do. Bill, it's your birthday. And who remembered it? Who was there on the dot at 12 midnight? Happy birthday, darling. Well, the reading could have been better, but you said it. Now, many happy returns of the day. Many happy returns of the day. I get a party, don't I? Of course. Birthday and coming home, who'll I ask? It's no secret. I know all about the party. Eve wrote me. Eve? She did? Sure. She hasn't missed a week since I left. But you know all about that. You probably tell her what to write. Anyway, I sent her a list of the people to ask, so check with her. Yes, I will. How is Eve? Okay? Okay. I love you. I'll check with Eve. Hmm? I love you, too. Good night, darling. I thought a lot about that phone call. In the morning when Bertie came in with my breakfast. At 
a silly question to ask me. I don't think it's silly at all. All I said was you don't like Eve, do you? You want an argument or an answer? I'd like an answer. No. Why not? Now you want an argument. She's loyal and efficient. Like an agent with only one client. She thinks only of me, doesn't she? Well, let's say she thinks only about you anyway. How do you mean that? Well, I'll tell you how. Like, well, like she's studying you. Like you was a book or, or a play or a set of blueprints. How you walk, talk, eat, think, sleep. I'm sure that's very flattering, Bertie. And I'm also sure... Good morning. That... Oh, good morning, Eve. I'm going downtown now, Miss Channing. Is there anything else you've thought of? Well, there's that script to take back to the guild. I've got it. Those checks for the income tax, man. Right in this envelope. <laughs> Seems I can't think of a thing you haven't thought of. That's my job, Miss Channing. Eve, by any chance, did you place a call from me to Bill for midnight, California time? <gasps> Golly, I forgot to tell you. Yes, dear. You forgot all about it. Well, I was sure you'd want to, of course, being his birthday. And you've been so busy. I... It was very thoughtful of you, Eve. Mr. Sampson's birthday. I couldn't forget that. You'd never forgive me. As a matter of fact, I sent him a telegram myself. Did you say anything, Bertie? Who said something? Well, don't. <laughs> Theodore Dreiser's much-discussed novel of the 20s, An American Tragedy, has been made into a distinguished screenplay brought up to date in time and settings by Paramount under the title A Place in the Sun. A superb cast, Montgomery Clift, Elizabeth Taylor, and Shelley Winters. And the critics seem to agree that all three give the best performances of their careers. The story, told with mounting suspense, concerns a poor boy played by Montgomery Clift who finds comfort in a lonely factory girl, Shelley Winters. But as he progresses to wealth and success, he falls in love with Elizabeth Taylor and aspires to the social set of which she is a part. His unwillingness to marry Shelley when she needs him involves him in the famous boating accident that leads to his downfall. A Place in the Sun definitely deserves a place on your list of films to see. The cast alone, Bill, is a triple threat. And Elizabeth Taylor, as a wealthy society girl, wears such gorgeous clothes. For instance, Edith Head, Paramount's well-known designer, created a stunning, luxable costume for the important scene at the lake. It's white organdy with layers of organdy petticoats to give it that doll-waisted look so smart this season. It was luxed again and again, and stayed just as lovely as new. Shelley Winter's wardrobe looks extra drab by comparison. <laughs> well, she plans to make up for it on her trip to Paris. She's counting on a shopping spree, collecting gorgeous handmade slips and nighties negligees. And if I know Shelley, she took several boxes of Lux in her luggage to make sure her things get the safest possible care. Scores of famous Hollywood screen stars say there's nothing like new Lux with color freshener. It's perfect for all kinds of lingerie. Silks, rayons, nylons, and fine cottons. Whites stay dazzling white as new. Delicate colors more brilliant than ever before. No wonder makers of lingerie advise Lux 33 to 1. Why don't you get a big box of new Lux tomorrow? Give your nice things that nice as new Lux look. Act two of All About Eve, starring Betty Davis as Margot, Ann Baxter as Eve, Reginald Gardner as Addison DeWitt, and Gary Merrill as Bill. Bill's welcome home birthday party. A night to go down in history. Even before it started, I could smell disaster in the air. When I went down the stairs, I was surprised to find that Bill had already arrived. Well, looks like I'm going to have a very fancy party. I thought you were going to be late. How long have you been here? No, oh, just a few minutes. I ran into Eve. She wanted to know about Hollywood. She seemed so interested. She's a girl of so many interests. Huh, it's a pretty rare quality these days. A girl of so many rare qualities. And so she seems. And so you've pointed out so often. So many qualities so often. And so young. So young and so fair. I can't believe you're making this up. It sounds like something out of an old Clyde Fitch play. Clyde Fitch, though you may not think so, was well before my time. I've always denied the legend that you were in our American cousin the night Lincoln was shot. I don't think that's funny. Of course it's funny. This is all too laughable to be anything else. 
whipping yourself into a jealous froth because I spent 10 minutes with a stage-struck kid. 20 minutes. 30 minutes, 40, what of it? Stage-struck kid. She's a young lady of qualities. And I'll have you know I'm fed up with both the young lady and her qualities. Studying me as if I were a, a play or, or a blueprint. How I walk, talk, think, act, sleep. As it happens, there are particular aspects of my life to which I would like to maintain sole and exclusive rights and privileges. For instance, what? For instance, you. Darling, this is my cue to take you in my arms and reassure you. But I'm not going to. I'm too mad. Guilty. Mad. Darling, there are certain characteristics for which you are famous, on stage and off. I love you for some of them and in spite of others. They're part of your equipment for getting along in what is laughingly called our environment. You have to keep your teeth sharp. All right. But I will not have you sharpen them on me or on Eve. What about her teeth? What about her face? She hasn't cut them yet and you know it. Eve Harrington has never indicated anything to me but her adoration for you and her happiness at our being in love. And to intimate anything else doesn't spell jealousy to me. It spells a paranoid insecurity that you should be ashamed of. Cut, print it. What happens in the next reel? Do I get dragged off screaming to the snake pit? Excuse me, Miss Channing. Oh. Yes, Eve. The hors d'oeuvres are here. Is there anything else I can do? Thank you, Eve. I'd like a martini. A very dry and very double. <laughs> Well, I've been looking for you, Margot. Carrie and I have to run along. It's been a real swell party. Hmm. Where's Karen? Upstairs, Lloyd. Mm -hmm. Getting her coat, I think. How's the new play coming along? Footsteps on the ceiling? Hmm. All right, I guess. And the girl, is she still 20? Mm, 20-ish. It's not important. Don't you think it's about time it became important? Margot, you haven't got any age. Margot Channing is ageless. Spoken like a press agent. Lloyd, I'm not 20-ish. I'm not 30-ish. Three months ago, I was 40 years old. Forty. Four old. <laughs> that slipped out. I hadn't quite made up my mind to admit it. Now I suddenly feel as if I had taken all my clothes off. Week after week to thousands of people, you're as young as you want. As young as they want, you mean. And I'm not interested whether thousands of people think I'm six or six hundred. Just one person, isn't that so? You've had another fight with Bill, right? Bill's 32. He looks 32. He looked it five years ago, and he'll look it 20 years from now. I hate men. Don't worry, Lloyd. I'll play your play. I'll, I'll wear rompers and come in rolling a hoop, if you like. Now get out of here. Go find your wife. <laughs> it's so nice of you to come upstairs with me, Eve. I just wanted to be sure you'd find your coat, Mrs. Richards. Tell me, Eve, how are things going? You happy? <laughs> there should be a new word for happiness. Being here with Miss Channing, she's been so wonderful, done so much for me. Well, you've done your share too, Eve. You've worked wonders with Margot. Well, good night. Mrs. Richards. Oh, Karen. Karen. Isn't it awful? I, I'm about to ask you for another favor. After all you've done already. Oh, that's nonsense. It's just that Miss Channing's affairs are in such good shape now, and I... I heard Mr. Fabian tell Miss Channing that her understudy was going to have a baby and, and they'd have to replace her, so I... I... You want to be Margot's new understudy. I don't let myself think about it, even. But I do know the part so well. And every bit of the staging. But suppose I had to go on one night to an audience that came to see Margot Channing. Oh, no, I couldn't possibly. <laughs> well, I wouldn't worry about that. Margot just doesn't miss performances. If she can walk, crawl, or roll, she plays. The show must go on. No, dear. Margot must go on. But as a matter of fact, I... I don't see why you shouldn't be her understudy. Do you think she'd approve? I think she'd cheer. But Mr. Richards and Mr. Sampson... Ah, oh, they'll do as they're told. <coughs> well, then, would you speak to Mr. Fabian about it? After all, he's the producer, and if he doesn't like now, me... stop I... worrying. I seem to be forever thanking you for something, don't I? Good night, Karen. Good night, dear. So Eve became Margot's understudy. Naturally, I assumed that Margot knew and approved. Then, one Friday afternoon, Margot went to the theater. Someone else was leaving the cast, and Margot had consented to help with an audition. A friend of Addison DeWitt's, a Miss Caswell, was trying out for the part. Margot, 
How nice to see you. Waiting for someone, Addison. I think you'd be in the theater, side of your protege, lending her moral support. Oh, but I did. The audition, however, is over. But it can't be. I came here to read with Miss Caswell. The audition was called for 2.30. It's now nearly 4. Is it really? Who read with Miss Caswell? Bill? No. Lloyd? No. Well, it can't have been Max. Who? Well, naturally enough, your understudy. Well, I consider it highly unnatural to allow a girl in an advanced state of pregnancy. I refer to your new understudy, Miss Eve Harrington. He, my understudy. But didn't you know? Of course I knew. Ah, it uh, just slipped your mind. How was Miss Caswell? Frankly, I don't remember. It just slipped your mind. Completely. Nor can anyone else tell you how Miss Caswell read or whether Miss Caswell read or rode a pogo stick. Was she that bad? Margot, as you know, I have lived in the theater as a Trappist monk lives in his faith. And once in a great while, I experienced that moment of revelation for which all true believers wait and pray. You were one, Eve Harrington is another. I take it she read well. It was something made of fire and music, brilliant, vivid, unforgettable. How nice. In time, she'll be what you are. A mass of fire and music. That's me. An old kazoo with some sparklers. Tell me, was Bill swept away too? Or were you too full of revelation to notice? Uh, Bill didn't say, but Lloyd was beside himself. He, he listened to his play as if, he, as if it had been written by someone else. He, he said it sounded so fresh, so new, so full of meaning. How nice for Lloyd, how nice for Eve, how nice for everyone. Eve was incredibly modest. She insisted that Lloyd felt as he did, only because she read his lines exactly as he'd written them. The implication being that I have not been reading them as written? Uh, to the best of my recollection, neither your name nor your performance entered the conversation. Uh, may, I, uh, may I give you a lift somewhere? No, I came here to help with an audition. I'll just run on in to see so they'll know I did come after all. I must start wearing a watch. I never have, you know. Well, how are you, darling? Terribly sorry I'm late, Max. Max, lunch was long and I couldn't find a cab. Well, shall we start? Where's Miss Caswell? Oh, hello, Bill. Hello, Lloyd. Oh, hello, Eve. Hello, Miss Channing. It's all over, Margot. What's all over? The audition. Eve read with Miss Caswell. Eve? Oh, how enchanting. However, did you get the idea of letting Eve read? Well, she's your understudy. Eve, my understudy. I had no idea. Why, I thought you knew. She was put on over a week ago. Miss Channing, I can't tell you how glad I am that you arrived so late. Really, Eve? Why? If you'd been here to begin with, I never would have dared to read. I couldn't have. What a pity. All that fire and music going to waste. What fire and music? You wouldn't understand. I was dreadful, Miss Channing. Believe me. Oh, I'm sure you underestimate yourself, Eve. You always do. Oh, you'd have been proud of her, Margot. Eve was a revelation. Oh, to you too, Lloyd. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, among other things, it must have been a revelation to have a 24-year-old character played by a 24-year-old actress. Also, it must have seemed so, so new and fresh to you, so exciting to have your lines read just as you wrote them. Addison, you've seen Addison. So full of meaning, fire, and music. You've been talking to that fishwife. In this case, apparently as trustworthy as the World Almanac. You knew when you came in here that the audition was over, that Eve was your understudy, playing that childish little game of cat and mouse. Not mouse, never a mouse. If anything, rat. This genius of yours for making a barroom brawl out of a perfectly innocent misunderstanding at most. Perfectly innocent? Men have been hanged for less. I'm lied to, attacked behind my back, accused of reading your silly dialogue inaccurately, as if it were the holy gospel. I never said it was. When you listen as if someone else has written your play, whom do you have in mind? Arthur Miller, Sherwood, Beaumont and Fletcher? What makes you think either Miller or Sherwood would stand for the nonsense I take from you? You better stick to Beaumont and Fletcher. They've been dead for over 300 years. All playwrights should be dead for 300 years. That would solve none of their problems, because actresses never die. The stars never die and never change. Oh, you may change this star any time you want for a new and fresh and exciting one, fully equipped with fire and music, any time you want, starting with tonight's performance. I shall never understand the weird process by which a body with a voice fancies itself as a mind. Just when exactly does an actress decide they're her words she's saying and her thoughts she's expressing? Usually at the point when she has to rewrite and rethink them to keep the audience from leaving the theater. It's about time the piano realized it has not written the concerto. And you, I take it, Bill, are the Paderewski who plays his concerto on me, the piano? Where is Princess Fire and Music? Who? The kid, Junior. Gone. Mm, I must have frightened her away. I wouldn't be surprised. Sometimes you frighten me. Nothing but a, a body with a voice. No mind. Oh, what a body. What a voice. Oh. Ah, now calm down. The gong rang, the fight's over. I will not calm down. Don't calm down. 
You're being terribly tolerant, aren't you? I'm trying terribly hard. Well, you needn't be. I will not be tolerated, and I will not be plotted against. Here we go. Such nonsense. What do you all take me for? Little Nell from the country? She's been my understudy for over a week. Arrives here for an audition when everyone knows I will be here and gives a performance. Out of nowhere, gives a performance. You've been all through that with Lloyd. The playwright does not make the performance, and it doesn't just happen, and this one didn't. Full of fire and music and whatnot. Carefully rehearsed, I have no doubt, full of those Bill Sampson touches. I'm sick and tired of these paranoic outbursts. I didn't even know Eve Harrington was your understudy until half past two this afternoon. Tell that to Dr. Freud, along with the rest of it. No, I'll tell it to you. For the last time, I'll tell it to you. I love you. You're a beautiful and an intelligent woman. A body with a voice. And a great actress. You have every reason for happiness. Except happiness. Every reason. But due to some uncontrollable, unconscious drive, you permit the slightest action of a kid like... A kid? Of a kid like Eve to turn you into an hysterical, screaming harpy. Now, once and for all, stop it. Well, it's... It's obvious you're not a woman. I've been aware of that for some time. Well, I am. I'll say. Don't be condescending. Now, come on, Margot. Let's get out of here. I'll buy you a drink. Well, I'll admit I may have seen better days, but I'm still not to be had for the price of a cocktail like a salted peanut. Margot, let's make peace. Terms are too high. Unconditional surrender. Just being happy? Just stopping all this nonsense about Eve and Eve and me? Oh, it's not nonsense. I wish it were. Margo, tell me what's behind all this. I don't know, Bill. Just a feeling. I don't know. I think you do know, but you won't or can't tell me. I said before it was going to be my last try, and I meant it. I I just can't think of anything else to do. I wish I could. Goodbye, Margo. Bill, where are you going? To find Eve? That suddenly makes the whole thing believable. Oh, Bill. Bill. Frankly, Lloyd, I don't understand a word you're saying You're too angry for coherence Not only was she two hours late But then that childish, heavy-handed routine About not knowing Eve was her understudy Well, it's just possible that Margot didn't know Of course she knew, Addison told her Just tell me one thing, Karen, just one thing Somebody's got to stop, Margot all right, now who's going to do it? Who's going to give her that boot in the rear that she needs and deserves? <sighs> going to be a very cozy weekend, dear. What weekend? What are you talking about? Well, we're driving out to the country tomorrow night, just the four of us. Bill, Margot, you and I. Well, we've spent weekends before with nobody talking. Just be sure to lock up all the blunt instruments. <laughs> Lloyd was right, of course, that boot Margot had coming to her. Heaven knows she deserved it. We'd all felt those size fives of hers often enough. But how? How to do it? And then it came to me, my big idea. Only two people in the whole world would know. Also, the boot would land where it would do the most good for all concerned. After all, it, it was nothing more than a perfectly harmless joke, which Margot herself would be the first to enjoy. And no reason at all why she herself shouldn't be told about it in time, my big idea required a telephone call. Uh, hello? Oh, this is Mrs. Richards. Uh, will you please call Miss Harrington to the phone? Yes, Miss E. Harrington. Before we continue with Act Two of All About Eve, I'd like to introduce a special guest, Miss Jean Mayberry the charming daughter of the casting director at 20th Century Fox. I understand, Jean, that your career started with ice skating. That's right. I joined an ice show troupe and traveled all over, even to Cuba. A generation ago, ice skating in Cuba would have been as fantastic as an invasion from another planet. But today, such a possibility isn't so fantastic. 20th Century Fox has made a picture about it. The day the Earth stood still, a very provocative picture. Michael Rennie, as a man from another planet, arrives to warn the Earth that they must maintain peace or be destroyed. I was fascinated by the huge flying disc that carries him to Earth. And Patricia Neal was fascinated by Michael. And both Michael and Hugh Marlowe found her fascinating, too. Well, no wonder. She did look excitingly lovely in that simple wardrobe she wears in The Day the Earth Stood Still. Those magic white touches on her dress and white blouse are just as smart as can be. You know, while she was making the picture, they were luxed again and again. New luxe with color freshener 
just worked miracles, keeping them looking white as new, luxing after luxing. Amazing new lux, you know, keeps white silks and rayons whiter than ever before. And white cottons, from piquets to organdies, look dazzlingly white without bleaching. Colors stay unbelievably vivid and new-looking. Oh, I'm a Lux fan from way back, Mr. Kennedy. I was born and raised in Hollywood, so I know how the screen stars love Lux. Patricia Neal says, new Lux is even better than ever. Thank you, Jane, Jean May Mayberry. We were delighted to have you tonight. Women all over the country are excited about wonderful new Lux. Now they're using it for nicer everyday washables, as well as their loveliest dresses and blouses. It's so safe. The perfect way to give all washables that nicest new Lux look. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. The curtain rises on Act Three of All About Eve, starring Betty Davis as Margot, Ann Baxter as Eve, Reginald Gardner as Addison DeWitt, and Gary Merrill as Bill. That was a cold weekend we spent in the country. Bill didn't come at all. Margot didn't know where he was and didn't care, she kept saying. Somehow we staggered through. Late Monday afternoon, Lloyd and I set out to drive Margot to the station, and my big idea went into operation. Its purpose was to make Margot miss her performance so that Eve would have to take her place. All I did was drain the gas tank of the car. My timing was perfect. Margot missed her train, and we sat there, the two of us, while Lloyd, cursing softly, went down the road in search of gasoline. Cigarette, Karen. Um, no, no, thank you, dear. I haven't been very pleasant this weekend. Well, we've all been a little tense lately. Mm, come to think of it, I haven't been pleasant for weeks. For that, I'm truly sorry. More than any two people I know, I, I don't want you and Lloyd to be angry with me. Well, how could we? You're Margot. What is that? Besides something spelled out in light bulbs, I mean. Besides something called a temperament, which consists mostly of swooping about on a broomstick and screaming at the top of my voice. Infants behave the way I do, you know. They'd get drunk if they knew how, when they can't have what they want, when they feel unwanted or, or insecure or unloved. What about Bill? He's in love with you. More than anything in this world, I love Bill, and I want Bill, and I want him to want me, but me, not Margot Channing. And if I can't tell them apart, how can he? And Karen, about Eve. I've acted pretty disgracefully toward her, too. Well, I... No, 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 don't fumble for excuses. Not here and now with my hair down. At best, let's say I've been oversensitive to... Well, to the fact that she's so young, so feminine and so helpless to so many things I want to be for Bill. Margot, I... I want you to know how sorry I am about this. About what? Getting stuck like this. I, I can't tell you how sorry I am. Oh, Karen, don't give it a thought. One of Destiny's merry pranks. After all, you didn't personally drain the gasoline tank. What? I said you didn't personally drain the gasoline tank. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is Addison DeWitt. It is now my turn to tell you all about Eve. That night, with Margot Channing marooned in the country, Eve Harrington took her place on the stage. Her performance was magnificent. But one thing puzzled me. Why was I invited to that particular performance, along with half a dozen other critics, a performance about which the management knew nothing until curtain time when Margot failed to appear? Afterwards, I went backstage. The dressing room door was closed, but I had no trouble overhearing a rather interesting conversation. Eve and Bill Sampson. So you can be very proud of yourself, Eve. That was a wonderful job you did tonight. I'll admit I was worried when Max called me. I had my doubts. You shouldn't have had any doubts. Well, your audition the other day was one scene. 
The woods are full of one-scene sensations. But you did it. With work and patience, you'll be a good actress, if that's what you want to be. Is that what you want me to be? Well, I'm talking about you and what you want. So am I. Well, what have I got to do with it? Everything. <laughs> the names I've been called, but never Svengali. <laughs> good luck, Eve. Don't go, Bill. Don't run away. From what would I be running? You're always after the truth, on stage. What about off? I'm for it. Then face it. Ever since that first night here in this theater. When I told you what every young actress should know? When you told me that whatever I became, it would be because of you. Your makeup's a little heavy. And for you. You're quite a girl. You think? I'm in love with Margot. Hadn't you heard? You hear all kinds of things. I'm only human. Rumors to the contrary. And I'm as curious as the next man. Find out. One thing. What I go after, I want to go after. I don't want it to come after me. Just score it as an incomplete forward pass. I waited a reasonable length of time after Bill left, and then I too had a chat with Eve Harrington. I wanted to write a column about Eve. There were many questions to ask. It's so kind of you to stop by, Mr. DeWitt. I'm glad you like me tonight. But it's still Miss Channing's performance. I'm just the carbon copy you read when you can't find the original. I've heard about uh, your modesty, Miss Harrington, but I think the time has come for you to shed some of your humility. <laughs> It's just as false not to blow your horn at all as to blow it too loudly. I don't think I've done anything to sound off about. One pretty good performance by an understudy. It'll be forgotten tomorrow. It needn't be. Why not? I'm a nobody. I am somebody. You certainly are. After you change, if you're not busy, we could have supper. I'd love to. Or should I pretend I'm busy? Well, let's have a minimum of pretending. I shall want to do a column about you. I'm not even enough for a paragraph. There's so much I want to know. I've, I've heard your story in bits and pieces, your home in Wisconsin, your tragic marriage, your fanatical attachment to Margot. Uh, it uh, started in San Francisco, didn't it? Yes. Yes, that's right. And uh, that memorable night when Margot first dazzled you, what theater in San Francisco was that, Eve? Was it the uh, Schubert? Yes, the Schubert. Ah, fine old theater, the Schubert, full of dignity and traditions. Tell me, uh, what was your husband's name? Eddie. Eddie what? Really, if I'm ever going to change, I'll only be a moment, Mr. Duet. <clears throat> Where would you like to go, Eve? We must make this a special night. You take charge. Thank you. I th believe I will. I learned a lot about Eve that night. After I brought her home, I went to my office to write my column. What I wrote pleased me exceedingly. Stop saying you can't believe it, Karen. It's right here in print, isn't it? Listen to this. Miss Harrington had much to tell about the lamentable practice of permitting, shall we say, mature actresses to play roles requiring a youth and vigor of which they retain but a dim memory. I still can't believe that About Eva... the understandable reluctance on the part of our entrenched first ladies of the stage to encourage younger actresses. About Miss Harrington's own long, unsupported struggle for the opportunity. But Eve couldn't have said anything like that. What gets me is how all the papers in town just happened to catch that particular performance last night. The little witch must have sent out Indian runners. Well, she won't get away with it. Nor will Addison do it and his poison pen. And don't try to tell me I... I came as soon as I read that piece of filth. Oh, Bill, thank goodness. Oh, Bill. Margo, Margo, Bill. I ran all the way. Bill's here, baby. Everything's all right now. I, uh, I guess at this point you and Margo might rather be alone. Yeah, do you mind, Karen? Margo, Margo, baby. Thanks, Karen. We'll phone you later. <laughs> That very night, Eve and I were having a bit of supper in the cub room when they walked in. Margot, Bill, Lloyd, and Karen. They seemed unusually happy and gay. In brief, our big news is simply this. Margot and I are going to get married. Glory, hallelujah. Well, love. Margot, Lord. when? When are you going to do it? Tomorrow we meet at City Hall at 10. And you, Margot, are going to be on time for once. Yes, sir. City Hall, that's for prize fighters and reporters. It's only for the license. There's a three-day wait for blood tests. I'll marry you if it turns out you have no blood at all. What are you going to wear? Oh, something simple, a, a fur coat over a nightgown. <laughs> the point is, we want you two beside us as our nearest and dearest friends. Which we are, which we'll always be. Excuse me, Mrs. Richards. Oh, yes, waiter. Uh, this note, it's for you. Oh, thank you. 
A very indiscreet Karen. Next time, tell your lover to blow smoke rings at half a glass. The world is full of love tonight, Lloyd. No woman is safe. Well, this beats all world's records for running, jumping, or standing gall. Margot, here, read this. Please forgive me for butting into what seems such a happy occasion, but it's most important that I speak with you. Please. And that's underlined. Meet me in the ladies' room, Eve. I understand she's now the understudy in there. Well, after all, maybe Eve just wants to apologize. I have no possible interest in anything she'd have to say. But what could she say? That's what fascinates me. Go on, Karen, find out. Karen, during all the years of our friendship, I have never let you go into the ladies' room alone. Now I must. I am busting to find out what's going on in that feverish little brain waiting in there. Well, all right. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Karen. I just had to speak to you. I don't know what you have to tell me, Eve, but I won't believe a word of it. <coughs> Why should you? It's about Mr. DeWitt's column. Oh, <laughs> are you going to tell me you didn't really say any of those things? All I know is that, well, you find yourself trying to say what you mean. But somehow the words change. They become his words. And suddenly you're not saying what you mean, but what he means. I just wanted you to know Responsibility is mine, and the disgrace. Oh, now, let's not get over dramatic. You really have a low opinion of me, haven't you? You'll be glad to know I've been told off in no uncertain terms all over town. Miss Channing should be happy to hear that. Now, Eve, don't cry. I'm not crying. After all, you still have a powerful friend left in Addison DeWitt. He's not my friend. You were my friends. I wish I'd never met him. I'll never get over this. Never. Oh, yes, you will. You're very young and very talented, and believe it or not, if there's anything I can do... I... There is something. Yes. I think I know. Something most important you can do. Lloyd's new play. You want to play the lead. You want me to tell Lloyd I think you should play Cora. If you told him to, he'd give me the part. He said he would. Don't you know that part was written for Margot? It might have been 15 years ago. It's my part now. You've got to tell Lloyd it's for me. I don't think anything in the world would make me say that. Addison wants me to play it. Over my dead body. That won't be necessary, Karen. Eve, Addison knows how Margot happened to miss that performance last night. And how I happened to know she'd miss it in time to call him and notify every paper in town. Oh. You'd better sit down, Karen. You look a bit wobbly. If I play Cora, Addison will never tell what happened, in or out of print. A simple exchange of favors. I'm so happy I can do something for you at long last. Your friendship with Margot, your deep, close friendship. What would happen to it, do you think, if she knew the cheap trick you'd played on her for my benefit? No. It'd be so much easier for everyone concerned if I were to play Cora. So much better theater, too. You do all that just for a part in a play. I'd do much more for a part that good. Excuse me, Karen. Addison's waiting. Care to look at a menu, Eve? But you can't be very hungry after all that humble pie. Oh, nothing of the kind. Karen and I had a nice talk. Including a casual reference to the part of Cora and your hopes of playing it. I discussed it very openly. And Karen mentioned, of course, that Margot expects to play the part. Oddly enough, she didn't say a word about Margot. Just that she'll be happy to do what she can to see that I play the part. And just like that, huh? Just like that. You know, Eve, sometimes I think you keep things from me. I don't think that's funny. It wasn't meant to be. I confide in you and rely on you more than anyone I've ever known. To say a thing like that now, without any reason, when I need you more than ever. I hope you mean what you say. I intend to hold you to it. We have a great deal in common, it seems to me. Well, what happened, Karen? Oh, nothing much. She apologized. With tears. With tears. Very classy stuff. Lots of technique. Groom. Hmm? May I have a wedding present? What would you like, Texas? I want everybody to shut up about Eve. Just shut up about Eve. That's all I want. Never have I been so happy. So happy and so forgiving. 
I forgive Eve. Do you know why I forgive Eve? She left good behind, the four of us here together. It's Eve's fault. I forgive her. And Bill, especially Bill. She did that too. You know, she probably means well after all. She is a louse. Never try to outguess Margot. Correct. Which brings me to you, Lloyd. Lloyd, promise not to be angry with me. Well, that depends. I'd better just come right out and say it. I don't want to play Cora. You... What? Now, now, wait a minute, Karen. You've always been so touchy about his plays. It isn't the part. It's a great part and a fine play. But not for me anymore. Not for a four-square, upright, downright, forthright married lady. What's your being married got to do with it? Oh, it means I've finally got a life to live. I don't have to play parts I'm too old for just because I've got nothing to do with my nights. Oh, Lloyd, I know you've made plans. Oh, please understand. Please. <laughs> What's so funny? Oh, nothing. Nothing? Everything's so funny. Everything. In due time, they were wed, Margot and Bill. Also in due time, rehearsals started for the new play, starring Eve Harrington. Occasionally, I'd drop by the theater, not only to admire Eve, but to be amused at the increasing tension developing because of Eve between those two old friends, Lloyd the writer and Bill the director. Something was in the air. The play was now ready for its out-of-town opening in New Haven. That afternoon, I saw Eve at her hotel. It's strange, Edison. I thought I'd be panic-stricken. Want to run away or something. Instead, I can't wait for tonight to come. To come and go. Are you sure of tonight? Aren't you? Frankly, yes. It'll bring me everything I've ever wanted. The end of an old road, the beginning of a new one. All paved with diamonds and gold? You know me better than that. Paved with what, then? Stars. What time is it? Uh, Almost four. Oh, good. Plenty of time for a nice long nap. You could sleep now, couldn't you? Why not? The mark of a true killer. Sleep tight, rest easy, and come out fighting. Why did you call me a killer? Oh, did I say killer? I, I meant champion. I get my boxing terms mixed. Oh, by the way, there'll be a party here tonight. You'll come, won't you? We're having everyone up after the performance. We are? Lloyd and I. I find it odd that Karen isn't here for the opening, don't you? She's always been so fanatically devoted to Lloyd. Addison, a few moments ago, I said this would be a night to remember. I didn't mean just the theater. What else? Lloyd. He's going to leave, Karen. We're going to be married. So that's it. Still just the theater after all. It's nothing of the kind. Lloyd loves me. I know nothing of Lloyd and his loves. I leave those to Louisa May Alcott, but I know you. I'm in love with Lloyd. Oh, Edison, won't it be just perfect? There's no telling how far we can go. You'll write great plays for me. I'll make them great. You're the only one I've told, the only one who knows, except Lloyd and me. And Karen? She doesn't know. She knows enough not to be here. But not all of it. Not that Lloyd and I are going to be married. (coughs) Well, say something. Anything. Congratulations. Skoll. Good work, Eve. What do you take me for? Is it possible, even conceivable, that you've confused me with that gang of backward children you've played tricks on? That you've the same contempt for me you have for them? I'm sure you mean something by that, Addison. I don't know what. I'm nobody's fool, Eve. Least of all yours. I never intended you to be. Yes, you did, and you still do. I still don't know what you're getting at. You know it as well as I do. But Lloyd may leave Karen, but he will not leave her for you. What do you mean by that? I have not come to New Haven to see the play, discuss your dreams, or climb the ivy walls of Eli Yale. I have come here to tell you that you will not marry Lloyd Richards, or anyone else for that matter, because I will not permit it. Will not permit it? That sounds medieval, something out of an old melodrama. So does the history of the world for the past 20 years. Frankly, I had hoped that somehow you would have known, that you'd have taken it for granted that you and I... You and I? (laughs) Now remember, as long as you live, never to laugh at me. At anything or anybody else, but never at me. Now to begin with, your name is not Eve Harrington. It's Gertrude Schlesinski. Get out. It's true that you worked in a brewery, but life among the malt and hops was apparently not as dull as you pictured it. In fact, it got less and less dull until your boss's wife had your boss followed by detectives. She never proved anything, not a thing. But the $500 you were paid to get out of town brought you straight to New York, didn't it? She was a liar. 
She was a liar. There was no Eddie, no pilot. You've never been married. <laughs> that was not only a lie, but it was an insult to dead heroes and to women who loved them. <laughs> San Francisco has no Schubert Theater. You've never been to San Francisco. That was a stupid lie and not worthy of you. I had to meet Margot. I had to say something. Be somebody. Make her like me. But she did like you. She helped you and trusted you. You paid her back by trying to take Bill away. That's not true. <laughs> After you failed with Bill, you used my name and my column to blackmail Karen into getting you the part of Cora. And you lied to me about it. No, no. Sweetie. No. I had lunch with Karen not three hours ago. As always with women, she told me more than she learned. That I should want you at all suddenly strikes me as the height of improbability, but that in itself is probably the reason. You're an improbable person, Eve, and so am I. We have that in common. Also an inability to love, insatiable ambition and talent. We deserve each other. Are you listening to me? Yes, Addison. And you realize and you agree how completely you belong to me? Yes, Addison. Then take your nap. And good luck for tonight. I won't go on tonight. I couldn't, not possibly. I couldn't go on. You'll give the performance of your life. I won't, I won't, I can't. But of course she did. And ever since, her triumph has endured. That is why she's here tonight, here at the Sarah Siddons Society. Eve is now on the dais, so gracious and modest, telling the honored members and distinguished guests that the award belongs not to her, but to those who made it possible, Margot and Karen, Bill and Lloyd. Let's listen in. For without their confidence in me, their kindness and friendship and faith, this night could never have been. How can I ever repay them? Although, although I'm going to Hollywood next week, do not think for a moment that I'm leaving you. My heart is here in the theater. I'll be back to claim it, and soon. That is, if you want me back. She's coming toward me now to our table. It'll take a while, all those photographers, and then, of course, she'll have to pause for a moment at their table. Margot's and Bill's, Lloyd's and Karen's. Congratulations, Eve. Thank you, Karen. Nice speech, Eve. But I wouldn't worry too much about your heart, that little statue they gave you. You can always put it where your heart ought to be. Oh, Mr. DeWitt. Why, Miss, Miss Caswell. How nice to see you again. Isn't she wonderful, Mr. DeWitt? There's no one like her, Miss Caswell. No one in the world. Tell me, Miss Caswell, do you want someday to have an award like that of your own? Oh, more than anything. Then you must ask Miss Harrington how to get one. Miss Harrington knows all about it. We hope you enjoyed our show as much as our stars enjoyed doing it for you. Of course, you know what a reputation screen stars have for beautiful clothes. Well, you can give your washables the very same care the stars insist on for their own gorgeous things. It's New Lux with Color Freshener, the most wonderful improvement ever made in a wonderful product. Don't take my word for it. Try it yourself, and you'll agree you've never seen anything like the magic it works on colors. It actually keeps white things white as new, makes colors sparkle like jewels, and keeps your prints sharp and brilliantly clear. No other soap, no other type of suds is safer for your nice things. Your washable silks, rayons, nylons, and fine cottons. Once you've tried new Lux with color freshener, you'll never again put up with anything else. Get a big box of new Lux with color freshener tomorrow. Use it for all your washables. You'll be thrilled with their nice as new Lux look. And here they are, an outstanding cast to take a bow for outstanding performances. Betty Davis, Ann Baxter, Reginald Gardner, and Gary Merrill. And how nice to have you back again. We haven't seen you here since the arrival of little Katrina. You know how I love appearing on the Lux Radio Theater. Love appearing indeed. Quite a way to get some more Lux flakes, Ann. <laughs> Betty, when you have a new baby, you need all the Lux you can get. Watch this girl remember as Eve. She'll want all our Lux flakes in a minute. Now, girls, the play is over. There's plenty in the wings for all. Lux flakes really are a must in our house, even before Katrina. 
All this talk of young children. Why didn't anyone ask me to be a godfather? Do you think you're quite the type? After listening to you for the last hour, I, I thought you relished little children as part of your diet. Well, don't be silly. I just finished a picture of 20th Century Fox starring Clifton Webb called Elopement, in which I played a godfather. Now I'm at RKO in Androcles on the Lion. Typecasting again. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> 